Hello, hi, my name is Klaus Tyman. I'm the founder of Project Pressure, and we are in Landskrona in Sweden at the Landskrona Photo Festival. I'm surrounded by photographs as Project Pressure have an outdoor show here as part of the festival. The festival theme is the architecture of memory. Project Pressure is not just me. Project Pressure is a charity I founded in 2008. At that time, climate deniers were called climate skeptics, and I wanted to do a project that was about climate change. Climate change being a very, very urgent environmental matter that we needed to deal with, and still need to deal with. I had a sense of urgency, I wanted action, and I thought, let's create a project that people can engage with and use art as a positive touch point to get people to deal with an otherwise really depressing subject. Climate change is not for everyone, it's really boring and dull. Scientific facts and figures, etc, etc. But if we can use photography, maybe we can make it fun, or at least something people want to engage with. So where do we start? Well, we start with the fact that climate change is very difficult to illustrate. Climate change is small particles in the air. It's uh, CO2 particles in the air. We count them as particles per million. So you can't really see it. The effects are difficult. They are divided by time and geographic location according to where they are emitted. So the Western world has emitted tons of carbon and the effects are being felt elsewhere. One way to illustrate uh, climate change is glacier recession. A glacier being a body of ice that with uh, global heating or global warming recedes. Year and year comparisons is a very good indication of long-term trends. So glacier recession is a fantastic way to illustrate, illustrate what climate change looks like. Unlike flooding, wildfires or other weather events that are part of the weather system, glacier recession is a very, very it's a scientific way to eliminate all the noise that the weather provides and just have climate change. Remember, back in 2008, people were still asking, oh, is climate change real? Is it real? Is it happening? Uh, God knows how many acres of wildfires and flooding and catastrophes later, yes, it is happening. What I thought back then also is that if I make a project about ice and climbing mountains, it becomes a project about the man in the mountain and it fits into this classic uh, explorer type thing and it, the story becomes about the individual. So creating Project Pressure, we set it up as a charity. First, we established collaborations with uh, some very, very clever people, with NASA, with the World Glacier Monitoring Service and a bunch of scientists around the globe. Anyway, so a whole group of people dealing with the subject of climate change. That way we could use art uh, as a positive touch point to get people to think about climate change. But thinking is not enough. Anyone who's opened a newspaper or browsed the web page or even heard are fully aware that climate change is happening. It's not that we need awareness, we need action. But it's also very depressing to deal with. So we were hoping that this project showcasing landscape, showcasing glacier recession, showcasing beautiful photography can get people to, can stimulate an interest and can be, get people, that would be the first step in the journey to action. So use the art, engage with the subject, be curious, but go granular and understand what's happening. Next, figure out what you can do and then create the action. The action has to happen on many levels, on the individual level, but primarily on the government and uh, the uh, structural sectoral level. It's not the responsibility of the individual to change the world, but collectively we can make a difference. So welcome to Landskrona Festival and welcome to Project Pressure at Landskrona. Hello Landskronians. Um, Mrs. Norfolk is at the that end of the room. She's in a medical conference in Budapest and I'm at this end of the room in a photo festival in Sweden. Although, to be honest, both of us are in the suburbs of North London. Uh, Sweden. Sweden. Hope you like it. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the work that I made uh, in Mount Kenya uh, a few years ago now, uh, probably about 2014-15 I think. Um, 
I began my career very much as a, as a conflict photographer. Uh, I spent 10, 12 years photographing in uh, war zones, Afghanistan in particular, but also Iraq and uh, uh, Bosnia, Northern Ireland, Lebanon. Um, and what interested me in those places, I mean, I describe myself as a photographer, but really I'm an archaeologist. My job in these places is to find objects in the landscape. I'm not interested in the experience of war or even the horror of war. I'm interested in, in war's poetry and I'm interested in war's archaeology. Uh, my job is to find objects in the landscape, pull them out of the landscape and go, <laughs> look what I found. Uh, and, and for me, that feels much more like an act of archaeology than an act of photography. That's what interests me. That idea of, of uh, reaching back through time and bringing back objects through time. What infuriates me about my camera is on the top of it, it says a 30th, a 15th, eighth, quarter, half, one second. And I want to keep turning that dial. I want to keep turning and turning that dial so that it says a year, two years, a hundred years, a thousand years. That's the exposure that I'd like to make with my camera. And that's, for me, the places that are most interesting are those places where you can pierce through history, where you can penetrate through and pull back history across this time. Because for me, it's the gap between those two things which is more interesting than what happened then and what is happening now or even my photograph of what happened now. Uh, what is interesting for me is what has happened in between. So when I photograph these landscapes for me it's more important to try and make them look like archaeological fragments or some kind of scenes of archaeology uh, where uh, time has passed between the, the the picture. Trying to make these pictures look like, you know, quite obviously trying to make this this picture from Afghanistan is meant to look like the Arch of Constantine in Rome or this building, which to be honest, later on I found was the Institute of Archaeology. How great is that? Um, uh, but when I photographed it, I was attempting to make it look as much as I could like the Parthenon, clearly. Uh, and this picture of mine, which is probably the most well known of mine, of this man selling balloons in Afghanistan, the reason why I love it is because it, it's, it looks so much like a Stonehenge. So when I was in these places, uh, I, I did a, an, an entire book about a photographer that was in Afghanistan in 1878, the first ever photographer that went to Afghanistan, uh, an Irishman called John Burke, who went with the British soldiers in the Second Anglo-Afghan War. And um, for a while I became a bit of an expert on John Burke. <coughs> I had a solo show at Tate Modern, and because of that people would send me Pictures. Oh, I found this in a trunk of grandpa's, great grandpa's pictures. Or, uh, uh, is it a John Burke? Is this a, is it, you know, did John Burke take this picture? Uh, and there's hundreds of these pictures came home with British soldiers. And I was sent this pair of pictures. I thought nothing of it. This, they're all like this. They all look like this. Uh, and it wasn't after, until a great deal of staring at this picture that it finally realized what is significant here. Of course, you've already realized because you are sophisticated photographic observers, yes? You, understand, you can see what's interesting about this picture, can't you? Can't you? Can't you? It's the same people. It's the same people. The, the top picture is in 1878 and the bottom picture is in 1880. And it's the same bunch of lads, it's the same bunch of soldiers. What's happened in between these two pictures is Afghanistan has happened. Afghanistan has chewed the hell out of these boys. And you can see that where they started out in 1878, dressed for India, thin cotton clothes, looking rather formal and smart, and after being chewed up by Afghanistan and the winters of Afghanistan in particular and the Afghan soldiers, Afghan war has beaten them up, and that two years later they look hammered, they look battered, they look older, a little bit wiser, but um, their skin is more suntanned, their uniforms are much more informal, they're using animal skins and carpets to make their own uniforms. Also, physically, the photographer has a problem in 1880, which is that they are actually closer together. He's actually cropped off the ends of the pictures because it was empty space. When soldiers come under attack, they bunch up. And you can see that these soldiers are actually even occupying a smaller piece of space after spending two years in Afghanistan. Less, less formality, perhaps, but also a slightly fearful bunching up under attack. Uh, and the British got chewed up in Afghanistan in 1878. They got heavily battered. And Afghans are incredibly proud of the fact that they uh, uh, smashed the hell out of the British in 1878. So it's the gap between these two pictures, interestingly, trying to imagine into that space between what on earth happened to these soldiers? 
that it made them look like this two years later, that it so transformed them. And it's the transformations that interest me. And so when I went back to Afghanistan in 2011, I reset up some of these photographs, copying a lot of these motifs from John Burke to try and photograph the modern equivalents of Burke's portraits. What would he see there now in that country that would interest him? What, would, how, what kind of portraits would he make of the British ambassador or American soldiers or aid workers and the rest of it? So when Project Pressure approached me and said, Fancy photographing climate change? I'd never thought about it at all. But it's, it would seem to me an intriguing idea to try and take what I'd learned on the battlefield uh, and try and transfer that to photographing, in particular, Project Precious Intra, which is glaciers and the disappearance of the world's glaciers and recording that disappearance. Trying to photograph, uh, again, a, a history, a, an absence, the disappearance of an object. It's a tricky project as a photographer. How do you photograph something that is no longer there? Uh, and that's a very intriguing idea. So I was very drawn to the idea. Uh, in particular, uh, Klaus Tuman of Project Pressure sent me towards the uh, Mount Kenya, uh, which is in Kenya. It's not Kilimanjaro, that's in Tanzania. Mount Kenya is in Kenya. Um, uh, photographing in Mount Kenya uh, because, first of all, it's an intriguing idea. Glaciers in Africa, really? Yes, there are a few, not many, and they're disappearing really quick, but there are some glaciers in Africa um, on the very highest mountains. Um, so photographing this glacier in Africa, but also uh, as a kind of um, totem of the world's disappearance, that some of those people who will suffer the most from climate change are some of the, are those people which have contributed the least to the process of climate change. Most people in Kenya don't have air conditioning, don't have a big SUV, don't have a high carbon lifestyle, and yet these people will be some of the first people that feel climate change's effects. Um, and it was a very simple mapping experience. Uh, and Klaus Tuman and Project Pressure were very helpful in putting me together uh, with the academics, because Mount Ken uh, particularly at the University, the Institute of the Cryosphere at the University of Salzburg, because they have been in charge of really almost like a hundred years worth of research. Scientists have been going to Mount Kenya, and particularly the Lewis Glacier, which is the biggest glacier on Mount Kenya, uh, really since the 1930s. Uh, and it's been mapped and recorded again and again and again. It's just become a kind of totemic uh, glacier where many, many times it's been recorded. And the quality of the mapping is superb. And for me, it was important that I was able to say, this is, is exactly where the glacier's front was in 1934 or 1960, 1988, 2010, and that's where the little eroded stump of the glacier is now. Distance, in the distance, you can see this little remnants that is left on the top of the mountain, and the rest of it has disappeared. So the mapping was very important so that I could with confidence say, I know where I am. This is where the glacier was in 2004. That, that uh, veracity was important to me. That, uh, that's where the work gets its integrity. Um, so the mapping was, was very good and was very important, and particularly the more recent stuff is GPS, so that was very good, I could do it with the GPS. Um, but the problem with the maps is the maps are kind of dull. They don't really engage, they don't really excite you, they're very true, they're very objective, the data is fantastic, the data is pure and great, good quality data, and yet I can't seduce you into engaging with this subject by using these maps. They just don't carry the punch that I want. My job is to give it some punch. My job is to seduce you. My job, if there's one thing to take away from this little 10 minute lecture, is this. We will not cherish and look after those things in this world that we do not love a little bit. My job is to make you fall in love a little bit with this glacier, make you long for this glacier, make you feel uh, a sense of remorse about its disappearance, because if you feel that, then you will do something about fighting to preserve it, and you will do something to engage with the problems and the politics of climate change. Uh, so my job is very simple, it's a kind of propagandistic thing, really. I want to make you adore this little glacier and feel a great sense of tragedy about its disappearance. So. Um, it was uh, simple to do, it was very expensive. I managed to get a rich American magazine to pay for it. Um, but uh, um, I did design this little device. I call it my little pyrograph. It's for writing with fire. Uh, but it's very simple. It's just a, a bit of wire, some old carpet, uh, petroleum, and uh, a garden rake. I don't know what the word is in Swedish, but it's that thing that you use for scraping across the lawn to pull away the leaves in the autumn, uh, a garden rake. Uh, and uh, tied it all together, covered it in petrol, 
went out at night onto the top of the glacier where you could see the glacier in the distance. I had my mapping that told me and I'd marked out with uh, little tiny glow sticks where the line was in 1934, where the front of the glacier was in 1960, in 87, in 2001. Uh, and then I just walk across the glacier with the shutter of the camera held open for an hour or so. Uh, and I just go for a long walk with my fiery stick across the glacier, leaving this flame line behind burned into the sensor of the camera that shows you where the front of the glacier was at that time. Uh, it was important to me that it was very low tech and low fi kind of almost comically kind of low fi but it, I could have made this line with lasers, I could have made it with LEDs, uh, I could have made it with gas burners or something, but for me it was important to make this line with petroleum because it is the burning of hydrocarbons uh, that have uh, caused the disappearance of this glacier. And so by you doing, it's a, it's a, it, it is the cause of the crime, it, it, is, the, it is the weapon that did the murder. Uh, and that was important to me, to use petroleum to make the fire. And also, I think it's kind of respectful to the idea to do it in a low-fi way and not involve satellites or lasers or some other high-tech thing, which is just another gobbler of resources, but to do it in a very simple kind of uh, respectful way to the mountain, I think. Respectful to the idea. And then the great gift, of course, is that you get this beautiful orange versus blue thing, which is a really great place for a photographer to play. Uh, and then most of all, a fantastic idea of fire versus ice. What a great metaphor to, to, to juggle with, to play with. The idea of fire and ice and the two of them involved in a kind of battle with each other and the two of them kind of annihilating each other uh, is a really beautiful metaphor to play with. Uh, and, so, and that was a kind of gift of the flame line. So the, the flame line was, uh, it, it was very difficult to do, it was a, you know, a, 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 the endless battery failures, camera, weather changing. I think I was on the top of the mountain for the best part of two weeks, but I only made seven exposures in the entire time. I don't mean there's only seven good ones, I mean there are only seven exposures the entire time I was at the top of the mountain. Uh, battery failure, weather, uh, mist, climate, lenses fogging up, cameras falling over and dying, God knows. Uh, uh, people like these behind the scenes pictures. Here is an attempt by the photographer to wash his underpants at uh, three and a half thousand meters and his socks by the look of it. <laughs> Another failure. Um, but the pictures, I think, were a success. Uh, I think they, um, the American magazine loved them a great deal. Uh, they've been published a great deal. They've been shown at a lot of festivals um, because uh, I think they, I think they do their job of intriguing you, uh, quizzing you, making you feel curious, but also drawing you in and seducing you a little bit. My job is to cover stuff in honey uh, and give it to you and make you fall over and adore the thing. And I think that's what, uh, that's what I try to achieve with this work. Try and make the thing look beautiful and intriguing and therefore you will engage with it. And therefore maybe you will do something about thinking about climate change and you'll do something about the politics and the economics uh, of, of engaging with the entire issue of climate change. That's my task as a kind of uh, uh, a propagandist, as a didacticist, as someone uh, with a camera. So the work was, um, uh, I think is quite successful in that sense. In particular, the one that moves me the, great, the greatest is 1963. So, uh, so the pictures, uh, uh, you know, the mapping is 1980 or 2001, whenever the scientific expeditions were. But there was an expedition in 1963, and for me, those pictures are the most meaningful because I am 57 years old. No, get off. Yeah, I really am. You're so kind. Uh, I am 57 years old. I was born in 1963. And so the gap between that fire line and the front of that glacier now is my lifetime. That is the hydrocarbon, the hydrocarbons that have been born, burn, burned away by my high carbon lifestyle and the generation uh, around me. Uh, that is my life there in the, uh, laid out on the bare stones and the bare rock of the mountain between where the fire line is in 1963 and where the front of the glacier is today. This poor, sad kind of um, stump, uh, uh, this, uh, this remnant left behind on top of the glacier, on top of the mountain. And, and I think in the next 10 years or so, the, the Lewis Glacier will just disappear. It will become an ice patch and then it will become seasonal and then it won't exist at all. So uh, it's a sort of um, uh, a memento mori of an object which is kind of breathing its last disappearing like 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 that that rhinoceros the the last rhinoceros in or uh, some some beached whale that's washed up on a beach and is breathing its last before dying uh, and for me that's the sort of sadness of the pictures and that's the uh, the emotional engagement that I wanted to have um, 
that's all I have for you. I hope it's interesting. I hope it's useful. Uh, good luck with the rest of the festival. I'm not there, of course. I'm here in London. Uh, but I hope you found this useful. Uh, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me directly, we can't do it through this medium. Just send me an email, simon at simonnorfolk.com. Happy to hear from you. Enjoy the rest of the festival and thanks for listening. Stop recording. Hi, I'm Peter Funk. Uh, I'm showing images for my project, The Imperfect Atlas, uh, here at the Project Press Exhibition at the Las Cronas Festival, uh, summer 2020, or autumn 2020. Um, I want to talk a little bit about photography, because, I mean, uh, photography for me has been, for a long time, been the idea of the one shot, the one moment, the decisive moment. Uh, and that's how we usually have been understanding photography. But at the same time, scientists have been using photography as well, but using it uh, as proof, as a comparative images, the idea of comparing two images uh, where you can measure, you can see uh, how things are changing, like the past and present, uh, how things are developing, how things are retreating like we do here with uh, the glaciers, you know, comparing images that has been taken a long time ago to comparing to how they look now. So the same uh, technique I used for this project, uh, the Imperfect Atlas, I've been working on for over five years, and it's images from Washington State, photographing the glaciers on the mountains, uh, Mount Baker, uh, Mount Shuxon, uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, it's an area that's been a lot of tourism, uh, over the last hundred years so a lot of photos a lot of postcards has been made over these years and um, I online in shops uh, postcard websites has been finding these uh, postcards been buying them uh, over eBay etc etc and collecting uh, the postcards from I mean from a hundred years old to up to uh, 20 years old postcards and then I, with, uh, with tools like Google, uh, Google Maps, uh, Maps, and local help of guides, been able to locate where these photos have been taken. And then the idea is that I go back to that same spot using the same coordinates and redoing this photo. And then with the postcard and the, my photo, you can compare how the glaciers have been retreating. In a way, I mean, you could say, why use a postcard when there's so much uh, scientific uh, landscape photography that has made in the, in the time, you know, over time. Uh, I think the postcard has it like a, a story, uh, interesting value as a narrative. You know, it's the, it's the object that people use to send home from the holiday. It indicates the idea of that uh, it's made in a time where people came out to the nature they were there for leisuring relaxing and uh, but it was also possible uh, to come out to the nature in a very easy way by car going from Seattle driving out there uh, to now of course we protect the nature but we're also changing so much in the nature of uh, this kind of uh, the parks the mountains the glaciers are completely disappearing it's changing the ecosystem but it's also changing our relationship to the nature in a way of uh, we now talking about this Anthropocene era where man is completely taking over the nature. There's no more nature left in the world. Uh, so I think these two kind of images also come from two different times. Um, that's another element to these images. As you can see, they have kind of a tinted colors. They look like a painting. They look like a color photo that went wrong. Uh, it's because I use an old technique called RGB separation which is a technique uh, invented by James Maxwell and Thomas Sutton in 1861, uh, where they took a picture of an object by using three images, or taking three images, uh, first image with a red filter, second with a green filter, third with a blue filter, and combining that as a projection, rendered the first color image. So I took this technique because it was uh, made at a time where the industrial revolution took off and where you know human mankind started polluting. Uh, I used this technique in the whole project to make these images. 
so in a way they're comparative with the postcards, but they're also illustrative to how man has polluted the landscape. The Imperfect Atlas is the first project I've done on climate change. It started as a collaboration with the Project Pressure and is now traveling as a group exhibition. The project has also been published as a book in 2019, as called The Imperfect Atlas. I've done other big projects on human mankind and for a long time it was mainly the people in front of the camera I focused on. While slowly kind of realizing that nature was changing and disappearing, it became more and more important to make a project illustrating this climate change. So I decided to turn the camera around and to focus on the nature we are changing and polluting. And this became the per Imperfect Atlas, a project about the nature we once were part of and now are parting with, as much as about the glaciers disappearing. I want to finish off uh, showing the book I was mentioning earlier. It looks like this, uh, The Imperfect Atlas. I just want to say uh, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the show. I am here with French artist Noemi Goudel. She is exhibiting at Landskrona as part of Project Pressure with her triptych image from the Rhone Glacier in Switzerland. Welcome Noemi and I would like you to start to talk about this body of work that you are exhibiting at the festival. So the body of work that I have um, made uh, uh, with project pressure and that will be shown in uh, the festival is um, a triptych that I've made in the uh, Glacier du Rhone in Switzerland. Um, it was made, um, it was almost like a performance uh, that was made with uh, paper. So what I did here is I uh, photographed um, the, the glacier then I went back to my studio, I printed it on the pieces of paper and then I went back again and put it there in the, in the landscape, back in the landscape, exactly where it was. And uh, it was printed on a very special paper that disintegrates with water. So what we did is we mounted this um, paper onto um, a sort of um, plastic, very transparent plastic canvas. We put water on it so the, the image, um, the, the paper disintegrated with water slightly. So that's the process. The process is, was to kind of build this uh, gigantic um, replica of the landscape in front of the same landscape and to disintegrate it slowly. Um, and the reason why I chose to have a triptych is because I wanted to have uh, an idea of time. So um, I could have had, you know, like a hundred pictures one after the other, but for me the triptych was um, a way to show to show it moved and also the way for the images to, um, to so we could also see the details because for example, I have done a, um, uh, a series called Démantèlement um, uh, afterwards, which um, in, I used kind of almost the same technique, but it was in, you know, lots of different pictures, one after the other. So about uh, 40, 60 images in one frame, but the images were much smaller. And here, what I wanted to do with Project Pressure was to really have um, a sense of scale that was much different. So that's why the triptych worked uh, much better. So is the sense of scale also important because now in Las Cruna you are exhibiting your work in an outdoor presentation and it's about nine meters long, the three images, uh, and about like three meters tall. Is the scale also a factor for you when you're exhibiting the piece? Is it something that you have worked with in various exhibitions before? I have worked with scale quite a lot in um, in various um, exhibitions. This is quite uh, important for me to... What is important for me to, is to realize that when you look at an image as a, as a viewer, your body is involved. It's not just the eye that looks at the image and, you know, this perspective. It's also the body that, that um, moves around the work and is implicated in the work work so if you have a piece of work that is I also like to play with very small scale for example I've made stereoscope where you have to look through the lenses or very small images that you have to ve be very close and then I also like to play with images that that are um, uh, either integrated in a landscape or in an architecture and your body 
uh, stand completely differently because it stands like it could almost almost get in. So, and here in Lanskrona, I will play with the landscape that is at the back. So it's, for me, it's also the way to, uh, to integrate the um, images differently, but it's, um, it's always, um, it's almost like continuing the work. You know, there is, for me, there is always a research um, part that is very important and there is the production realization of the work and making how can we make it and, and because it's almost every time like a small performance and then there is how to present it in a, an exhibition space um, or uh, if, you know a festival or but um, how to engage with it so for me that's you know there are very many levels and many steps uh, in in order to produce the work. In this research phase, how did you select a specific location for your photograph at the Rhone Glacier? The reason why I worked in Glacier du Rhone is a very um, technical reason. Um, it's just because it's uh, accessible by car, not so far, and because my equipment is so big, I uh, had this huge um, met metallic frame, I had a camera, the paper was very large, I couldn't walk for hours on the top of a glacier and um, and do it there so unfortunately this is you know part of the um, uh, you know part of the, the the things I need to to keep in mind when I realize uh, an image is it's um, it's the whole uh, production and so I looked uh, with my my team we looked everywhere to find a glacier that was accessible and Glacier du Rhone was uh, amazing for that um, because it's, um, yeah, you can just park and then walk like 200 meters and you're right there in the middle of the glacier. And also, of course, it's a very amazing landscape as well. I think the, the because you have a, you know, a lake, uh, you have the glacier, you have the lake and then, and then it goes down again, which you can't see on the, on the image, unfortunately, but after the lake, it goes down again and then, in a um, sort of a waterfall. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing place. It's really, it's really, it's obviously very mineral and very, um, I completely fell in love with this, uh, this area. And when, when the audience is looking at your image, this kind of, because it's a very complex image, like you explained before, it's a, it's a performance within the image of having the layer of a photograph within the photograph and that this, Integrating as well. This to have the, is it important for you that the audience know about this process behind when they're when they're looking at the image? So for me, it's um, the reason why I have the image so large is because I really want or encourage the viewer to look at the details because all the clues uh, of the constructions are in the details. Um, so I, this is how I invite the viewer to understand the process and to understand how it's made. And I think it's obviously key to understanding Im the image. How do you see your body work as part of uh, Project Pressure's mission to activate the visitor, to move beyond awareness and to incite real behavioral changes? I work with my uh, images as I make um, research, scientific research, researchers, and especially at the moment, I'm looking at how the world used to be, so in terms of uh, relief and, and how the, where the mountains used to be, where the, the, um, the, the glaciers used to be, and the, and the, the desert, etc. And it helps me to understand the landscape, not only through human eyes, what we can see or what we have perceived through the, um, in the human history, but the landscape for what, you know, on what it is for itself. So from, uh, you know, millions and millions of years, it's always, you know, evolving and changing. And those researchers really helped me to look at, um, to look at the landscape now and to understand the landscape in, in the, its uh, um, globality, in its, um, um, so for, for, which is um, very uh, interesting because, for example, for the melt of the glacier, of course, the, 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 the glaciers have, you know, um, changed uh, so much for our time. And there was almost, um, there was a moment where the, 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 the whole earth was, um, was covered with, with ice. So they, they called it the snowball theory. Uh, um, so, so, of course, the, 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 
the face of the, the earth has been changed you know, drastically. But what is really interesting is to see that humans can only live on the planet in a certain, um, in a certain, um, uh, uh, how do you say, a, a balance. And have it affected you personally as well? I think during this process as well, you being there at the glacier, photographing it, seeing it, uh, seeing what is happening, have, how has that changed you personally? Has it affected your uh, the relation to climate change and how you behave? So being on the glacier for me was an amazing experience because um, um, I was there in the summer, at the end of the summer. So it was it was it was melted. Uh, most of it was um, was uh, I mean a big part of it was was melted anyway, um, and uh, and it really um, um, gave me a huge sense of nostalgia, you know, of this landscape that wasn't going to exist anymore. Um, and to see how um, how I can um, how is it possible to talk about that also because it's um, it's not only being it's not about being in a landscape that is uh, that is or in an environment that won't be um, um, uh, human friendly anymore but it's also about uh, about the world changing drastically and 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 things disappearing completely. Um, and that's, I think that's what I wanted to talk about in those images. So I was just thinking uh, to end a little bit of a reflection on how the work is exhibited in Landskrona. So we are doing this construction of the work where it's actually floating in water. So there's this direct dialogue with your work and that is actually on water. Do you have a comment on that or some of my thoughts about how that's, what kind of another layer that will bring to the work? Mm. So I'm really um, looking forward to seeing how it's um, uh, exhibited in the, in the festival on the water because it's not something that I've never done before, and um, and I'm curious to see how it uh, interacts with the work. You know how how the the water from the the, the glacier um, sort of continues into the real uh, landscape. Um, I think that's always interesting for me to to. Uh, experiment with uh, with ways of of, uh, of looking at the image the images so um, so let's see it wasn't uh, it wasn't my my uh, idea uh, but uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see how it looks thank you so much for answering these questions and uh, for letting the audience know more about your work and for participating in our online program and thanks to all the audience who have listened with us today.